ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to see so many of you here. Uh, thank you all very, very much for coming this evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Sacker. For those of you who travel and watch the BBC abroad, you'll know that I present a program called Hard Talk on the BBC World News Channel, which actually does get broadcast also on World Service Radio and on uh, the news channel here in the UK. And it's, it's an interview show. It's quite challenging. It's quite tough and intense. And uh, our guest star tonight chuckles because uh, he knows. He's been on it several times. And uh, he's, he's seen me with my claws out. And I've seen him in his uh, anti-claw mode. <laughs> um, but I'm not. I didn't bring the claws tonight. My job tonight is simply to host, to introduce, and to listen. And I'm very much looking forward to it because, uh, as you all know, because you're here, we've got the chance tonight to listen to Samin Campbell talking, reflecting upon something that is at the very top of our political agenda right now, that is Britain's relationship with Europe, with the European Union. We've called this Britain and Europe a common future. I suppose we could have called it something like Britain and Europe, a dodgy marriage, is it heading for divorce? Um, but the point is, we all have to consider what it would mean if there is to be a referendum, an in-out referendum, and how we would vote, and what the implications of a vote to leave Europe would be. And that's the sort of theme that Ming is going to address in just a moment. Before we start, I just want to reflect for a moment on this particular event. Uh, this is the seventh Lord Garden Memorial Lecture. And I think it's a, a really good moment to uh, remember uh, Lord Garden, Tim Garden, who was the chief of the RAF, who was also a huge uh, supporter and for a time director of Chatham House, a man steeped in international affairs, also a man who was politically committed. Sue, um, Tim's widow, uh, who has made this event possible, said to me before, I didn't know Tim, but she said, you know what, Tim was one of those very rare military chiefs who read The Guardian from cover to cover. Uh, so uh, I like that story, and I bet I would have liked Tim. Uh, I'm afraid I never got the chance to meet him. But tonight is all about mem remembering him, his commitment to serious conversation and serious thought and analysis of Britain's place in the world. And I think that's why it's so great that we've got Sir Ming Campbell with us tonight. So Ming, do please take the lectern. And let's give him a very warm hand. Uh, it's quite true. I've sat in the hard talk chair uh, with Stephen sitting on the other side. And I think I've still got the scars <laughs> on my back. Um, Air Marshal, the Right Honourable Lord Garden, was a polymath. He was a pilot, a professor, and a politician. And in all three of these roles, he excelled. He had degrees from Oxford and Cambridge. He was assistant chief of the air staff and then assistant chief of the defense staff, commandant of the Royal College of Defense Studies, director of Chatham House, life peer, and party spokesman on defense. And for me, therefore, it's a great privilege to follow the distinguished speakers who have preceded me in this a uh, series of annual lectures. But I remember him most as a good companion, a trusted advisor, and a loyal friend. I should tell you that by way of introduction, the theme for this lecture was chosen between me and Sue Garden about nine months ago, which you may think was remarkable anticipation or else pretty good luck on our part. Can I be clear, today I'm not offering a blueprint either for the European Union or for Britain's place in it, but rather my reflections on an institution going through a turbulent period and a, the num and a number of questions which this turbulence raises. Now, in this audience, I doubt very much that I'm alone in a profound sense of anxiety about the role of the United Kingdom in the European Union and, indeed, the future of that union itself. It's not simply because of recent election results and in due course, I shall come to these. But my anxieties have been heightened by recent events on the fringe of Europe, which suggest that the implied settlement of the post-Gorbachev era has come to an end. The European Union, together with NATO, has provided an interlocking architecture for stability 
on a continent where rivalries and territorial ambitions in the past have had their expression in conflict and destruction. That's commonplace for those who would broadly describe themselves as Eurosceptic to argue that NATO alone has provided that stability. In my judgment, such an analysis is flawed. Now, we now recognize a distinction between hard power and soft power. We usually do so as mechanisms for maintaining and even expanding our own influence and interests. Sometimes we do so by demonstrating military capability, sometimes economic superiority, always with an express or implied willingness to use either of them. But we do so to export our values of democracy, of human rights, and the rule of law. But I would argue that if our soft power and hard power are exportable, it is only because they are the glue that binds Europe and the transatlantic alliance together. And our joint commitment to these principles, therefore, is as much for the strengthening of our relations inter se as it is for trying to compel others to change their ways. We don't admit to the European Union those who don't share our values, nor to NATO those who likewise do not accept its principles. But it's self-evident in my judgment that neither soft power nor hard power in the, United, in the EU or NATO are as effective as when they're operating in tandem. It could perhaps be described as a modernization of the old Theodore Roosevelt maximum, speak softly but carry a big stick. Or as he later put it rather more elegantly, the exercise of intelligent forethought and of decisive action sufficiently far in advance of any likely crisis. Now it seems to me that those who argue for withdrawal from the European Union seem blind to the consequences for the political as well as the economic stability and security which NATO acting together provide. And there is a contemporary echo of this, and that is in the debate about Scottish independence, where there is similarly a failure to understand and recognize that separation inevitably means that common values will be replaced by competing interests. Now, it remains to be seen that Putin's Russia will be content with its recent self-aggrandizement. But if there's any doubt about the need for NATO and the EU to confirm and retain the joint purposes of both organizations, it has surely been more than extinguished by the events of the last few months. But in my judgment, this is no time, no time, to abandon or even to threaten to abandon collective purpose, economically, politically, and militarily. Now, none of this is to argue that Britain's relationship to the European Union, now and at all time coming, should be framed only by the blunt alternatives of in and out. For self-evidently, if I may be forgiven the solar system, there is a third alternative. But before we get to that, this, I think, for Euro enthusiasts, a category in which I number myself, is a time for Nostra Culpa, a time to acknowledge the failure to press the case for reform of the European Union. My judgment, it's as nihilistic to say that the European Union doesn't need to reform as it is to say Britain must be in or out. And I'm confident that this is a union which can be revived while at the same time preserving its core values. And I'm also equally confident that for the United Kingdom, this is much more likely to be achieved by constructive engagement rather than the threat to withdraw. Those of us, and here I speak, I have the great advantage and luxury of speaking for myself uh, and not necessarily for the Liberal Democrats. Those of us who support Britain's continued membership of the European Union have failed, in my view, on two counts, and I do not exempt myself from this criticism. A first failure has been to concede ground to the skeptic argument by failing adequately to continue to put the case for membership and by relying too much on the assumptions of 1975, the year in which, of course, the referendum was held, endorsing Britain's continuing membership. And one indication of this failure has been political parties' unwillingness to speak up for Europe, even in elections to the European Parliament. 
to the extent that when one party leader decides to make the European case, and you know who I mean, his decision to do so is not universally approved of by his own party, and it's regarded with surprise and scepticism by pundits and commentators. In truth, we've not defended our corner, and now, I would say, is the time to do so. But it is also time to pursue, along with allies, the reforms which will allow better implementation of the principles of the institution of the European Union in a 21st century, which provides a very different context from the post-war and Cold War environment in which the European Union was conceived. We have failed to make our case either for the principle of reform or indeed the utility of doing so. And therefore, we should not be surprised that the resulting space has been filled by misunderstanding, misrepresentation, and prejudice. This year, we celebrate many milestones in the European Union. 15 years of the Euro, 21 years of the Maastricht Treaty, and 63 years since the beginning of the common market. These are impressive numbers, which remind ourselves of the virtue of cooperation among different nations, different political ideologies, different cultures, and different populations. But a particular anniversary being commemorated this year highlights not only how remarkable, but how imperative that cooperation has been. For this is the 100th anniversary of the beginning of World War I, said to be the war to end all wars, a prediction which proved at once both optimistic and unachievable because within 21 years there was another brutal conflict. By contrast, with the exception of conflicts in Eastern Europe, the latter half of the 20th century has seen a conflict-free continent. The major European nations who were previously at each other's throats, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Spain and Italy, committed themselves to peaceful cooperation and not to conflict. No doubt, the horrors of ever-modernizing war were a spur towards that cooperation and common purpose. And so the European Union was created as a partnership of trust. And those who are old enough, let me suggest this to you. It would have been unthinkable in 1945 that Germany and Italy would have been welcomed into the early structures which led ultimately to the formation of the European Union. Now, amid some controversy, as you will know, the European Union was recently awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. But if, this, uh, but if the prize, if the award is not justified, then the citation which accompanied it most certainly is. Because the award was made for the stabilizing role the EU has played in transforming most of Europe from a continent of war to a continent of peace. The truth is that the two institutions of the EU and NATO showed a much more attractive alternative than Soviet communism. And again, growing integration in a more democratic Europe was exemplary in influencing Franco's Spain and Salazar's Portugal to embark upon the road to democracy. And in the end, the European Union provided also the inspiration which motivated, motivated countries emerging from the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet <sighs> Union to be ambitious in embracing the principles of democracy and respect for human rights. And all of this is astonishing when you consider that these post-Soviet countries, as recently as 1989, were under totalitarian governments. Much of their transition has been aided by financial and political assistance and guidance from the European Union. Take one example. Poland has, re has received about 67 billion euros since 2007, which amounts to about 3% of their GDP. The result, however, has been a 65% increase in their per capita GDP, often a better measurement of the extent of economic progress. Well, I can hear you say, progress for Poland may be intrinsically valuable, but how does that help the United Kingdom? Well, I have no hesitation in saying that the stability, security, and safety of the continent is in the interest of us all. We all benefit from peace. Only the manufacturers benefit from war. 
And we're not only donors, we're recipients as well. Development plans, investment and job creation bring a direct benefit from our membership of the European Union, as is the £8 billion on its way to the United Kingdom to assist, to assist economic progress. European Union-wide investment will help to improve our rail network, upgrade our energy supply, and British scholars have received Erasmus grants which have taken them uh, on the 21st century equivalent of what was once the continental tour open only to the sons of the rich. The years since the foundation of the European coal and steel community have not been without problems, but they've been characterized by peace and prosperity previously unthinkable. Now, I would argue that the disaffection which has grown up inside the European Union is not born out of weakness of the institution, but from a lack of proper direction within it. The European Union is the first of its kind. Never before had nations so different and previously so hostile to one another attempted such an ambitious effort at economic and political coexistence. But Britain's failure to join the European conversation until the 1960s meant that it was in no place to offer leadership until long after our accession. With greater and earlier engagement, we would have had greater influence. Now, I think it's true that our adversarial tradition of politics doesn't sit easily with the consensual European model. But influence comes from the ability to effect change. And if we were to leave the European Union, or indeed to persist in electing members to the Parliament whose motive is at best disruption and at worst destruction, our influence and our ability to effect change would clearly be much diminished. British governments of all colours, uh, even coalitions for that matter, have failed to explain the singular nature of a political and economic union embracing 28 countries. Now, many people now find it distasteful to talk about love of their country. And we should be proud of our history and of our nation's achievements. But it's arrogant to assert, either expressly or by implication, that we enjoy an unblemished record, or that we have occupied some golden age of perfection when the facts have been different. Those who argue for disengagement dream of an England that never was and a Britain that never can be. It's worth also reminding ourselves that 25 years ago, Great Britain led the argument that as soon as practicable, all of the countries which had escaped the communist straitjacket and were capable of doing so should join the European Union. In part, we did so in order to provide an institutional foundation for their ambitions of democracy. And of course, in the case of NATO, to provide security to underpin that democracy. So what should we do now about the union and our place in it? I'm going to ask a suitably pejorative question. Should we focus on popular contemporary concerns or long-term objectives? Well, even to pose the question is of course to answer it. The objectives of the European Union are shortly stated. Peace, prosperity, and security in common purpose with like-minded democratic states, respectful of human rights, and accepting the primacy of the rule of law. These are lofty ideals and may not always be immediately obtainable in a union of 28 states. It would be too much to expect that in all situations, in all circumstances, these principles could be infallibly applied. But they are a benchmark against which all behavior within the European Union should be measured. Now, some say the answer for Britain is to hold a referendum. I take the view that a referendum should only be a last resort when all other options are spent. The United Kingdom is still in a position to bring about the reforms that are Europe, of the European that are necessary and beneficial to us and all other members. And accepting the principle, as the coalition agreement provides, that a referendum would be justified if it was proposed to transfer additional powers of substance from London to Brussels, an in and out referendum would only serve to confirm among even our most sympathetic allies that we are half determined to leave the European Union unless we go to get our own way. After such a long and painful fight to recover stability in our economy, 
after the perils of the recession. I say it's not the time to scare away business or investment. And if you were considering a major investment in the United Kingdom between now and the possible date of an in-out referendum, would you pause for thought? I rather suspect you would. And if your investment, either existing or potential, rests on access to the single market, would you not want to wait for the outcome of that vote? And even supposing you were neutral on the question of in or out, would you not want to take account of the disruption to the economy which a United Kingdom withdrawal would inevitably cause? Attractive though it might seem, you cannot expect to vote for withdrawal and the next day complete that process. What uncertainties would there be and what would be the economic consequences of these? Let me turn now to the issue of security. Many of you will know that inside or outside the European Union, we would continue to be part of the arrangements known as the Five Eyes between ourselves, the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, which are unique in the field of intelligence sharing. But on a different level, the sharing of criminal intelligence, the coordination of police activity, and the European arrest warrant are essential elements to enable the United Kingdom government to fulfill its primary responsibility to protect its own citizens. There can be no barriers in an age when crime knows no borders to our ability to find, arrest, and bring to justice criminals. The European arrest warrant has put hundreds of criminals behind bars who would otherwise be a risk to us and to our allies. Does the warrant need reform? Of course it does. Extraditing people from Britain to Poland for the sake of a, an allegation about the theft of a wheelbarrow was never what these, pr these principles or these um, arrangements were designed to deal with. Of course, it requires reform. But would the United Kingdom be better off without the warrant? Of course not. Would we be best off with a reformed warrant? Of course we would. Because of the unifying effect of membership of the European Union and NATO, we no longer need to resort to force to resolve disputes in the way which was commonplace before the creation of the Union. But because we're not going into battle every few years, doesn't mean that we do not need effective military capability. Contrary to misunderstanding, either deliberate or innocent, there are no plans to create what is emotively described as a European army. The Treaty of Lisbon makes it clear that the United Kingdom or any other member state can remain separate from any deepening of military ties. But there is much to be gained from military cooperation. Take the United Kingdom, for example. Since the end of the 1990s, our defense budget has been much reduced. So that, for example, in the army, the target is that numbers should be cut from 102,000 to 82,000. And other countries under the burden of austerity have required to make similar decisions. And indeed, only four members of NATO reach the NATO recommended expenditure level of 2% of GDP per annum on defense. But within the EU framework, we and our allies can coordinate military spending and hence maintain and enhance joint capability. NATO remains the bedrock of our defense. But cooperation between the members of the European Union can make our contribution to NATO more effective at a time when either by pivot, the word first used to describe change of emphasis in American policy, uh, or rebalancing uh, its substitute from the word pivot engendered a certain degree of anxiety in Europe and elsewhere. The United States, while not intending to abandon Europe, is looking to the Europeans with justification to make a greater contribution to their own defense and security. Now, the principles to be applied are easily stated. Common procurement, force specialization, and interoperability. And all of these can be followed by members of the European Union without replacing or under, undermining NATO, but indeed complementing it. Now, you know that in this recent election, immigration played an important part of the discourse. And listening to some, one might believe that at any day now, an entire Eastern European nation would up sticks and be at our doorstep demanding entry. And even if they didn't steal our jobs, they would be living off the fat of the British benefit system. The facts, however, speak a little more for themselves. Nine out of 10 jobs in Britain are held by Britons. 
At present, there are about 2.3 million EU nationals living in the United Kingdom, while 1.7 million Britons live abroad in European Union member states. And though we often focus on migrants coming to the United Kingdom, let us not forget what withdrawal from the, United, from the European Union would do in respect of these 1.7 million Britons living in other states. So what are the 2.3 million doing while they live here? Between 2001 and 2011, migrants put 22 billion pounds into the UK economy. Out of, seven new, out of one out of seven new businesses is started by migrants. This is hardly an invasion and shows that migration benefits the United Kingdom far more than is popularly recognized or, or acknowledged. Is there a need for reform of the right of free movement? Of course. Is the United Kingdom alone in pushing for reform? No. Several other member states have already discussed the possibility of more uh, strict transitional arrangements to prevent mi vast migration, and it's frequently pointed out that it's entirely within the competence of individual states to make changes in the circumstances in which migrants can claim benefits. There are allies for the United Kingdom in this matter, but again, this requires engagement and not exceptionalism. But it's the economy which lies at the very heart of the European Union. We're still recovering from 2008 when we learned in a very painful way that we are unable to pretend to be able to act alone. Now, America, they've gone some way towards cleaning the house, but we have no say in the regulatory regime which they now wish to establish. <coughs> but in the European Union, we do have a say over such regulations. And leaving the European Union would give us little influence, as little influence, of the decision-making and role on these matters as we have in the United States. And here, perhaps, something of a party political broadcast. Last year, the United Kingdom, led by the former Liberal Democrat MEP Sharon Bowles, worked hard and successfully <coughs> to achieve influence over relevant EU regulations. Pulling out of the European Union would, je would, jeopardize, would jeopardize our economic recovery. Why is it that both the United States and China recently voiced public concern about the possibility of exit by the United Kingdom from the European Union? They have said that trade relations would be threatened. The USA is our second largest trading partner our largest trading partner with more than half of our total trade and three times that of the United States is the European Union. And leaving the single market and the trade agreements already in place could only hurt us in both the short term and the long term. Free trade agreements with emerging economies mean fewer barriers and more access for our goods and services. Through the European Union, we've negotiated agreements with South Korea, Colombia, Peru, Canada and Singapore. Because of the signing of the South Korea Agreement, the European Union, British exports in that country have increased by two billion pounds. In the event of withdrawal, we would lose the, lose the benefits of the access which flows from all of these agreements. We could, of course, renegotiate and seek to expand our own individual agreements, but how could we expect to negotiate terms as favorable as those, as those given to the largest economy in the world? But no institution is perfect. And let me return then to the issue of reform. Nor indeed can institutions, however well-founded in principle, ignore the changing environment of public opinion and expectation. Reform as conceived among those of our European allies who are sympathetic to our cause is unlikely to extend to rewriting the treaties or even amending them. In an era of skepticism, even only an attempt at amendment of the treaties could be fraught with risk, particularly in those countries which are constitutionally bound to call a referendum in response to any such treaty change. <clears throat> now, Mrs. Merkel's recent civility when addressing both Houses of Parliament and the Royal Gallery should not be taken to foreshadow sympathy or support for anything as substantial as the changes <coughs> which David Cameron needs to obtain in order to satisfy the most skeptical of his backbenchers. Most easily achieved will be steps which enhance the single market and reduce bureaucracy. Nor should it be difficult to achieve agreement on qualifying periods for the right to benefits. And we can do all that without breaching the principle of freedom of movement and capital which lie at the very heart 
for the single market. But the most important prize, and one which is readily within our grasp, would be a proper application of the twin principles of proportionality and subsidiarity, to which the present treaties pay lip service and no more. Principles which are frequently ignored either in the framing or the implementation of legislation. Proportionality, Brussels should not do more than it needs to do. And subsidiarity, Brussels should not do anything which can be better done by member states. Agreement that more political uh, weight should be attached to these principles should be the centerpiece of Britain's case for reform. And clipping the wings of the Commission would also, in my view, be of great significance. And here, if I, if I haven't been controversial so far, I'm about to be, and that is my view that to make Mr. Juncker the President of the Commission at this time will be deeply divisive. His appointment comes from another era, and to argue that there is majority support for him is to ignore the principle of the tyranny of the majority. Let me conclude by a recital of things which support my conclusion that Britain's best interests lie in membership and engagement. 2012, Britain contributed eight billion pounds to the European Union, or if you, per, if you prefer, one penny in every taxpayer's pound. Hardly excessive. Birmingham city centre was remodelled with six million pounds from the European Union. The European Union takes half of our exports and supports three million jobs. The car in this industry in this country owes its success to good management, skilled force, a skilled workforce, high investment and access to European markets. And the EU has improved performance throughout its whole membership in areas such as human rights, equal pay and discrimination. And the European Union, believe it or not, employs fewer people than Derbyshire County Council. It's the world's largest market. 80% of firms that trade in the UK do business with Europe. 60% of United Kingdom goods exported fall under the umbrella of trade agreements between the EU and worldwide markets. Let me conclude by saying this. Those of us who support our membership of the European Union must support its reform if we are to be credible in our advocacy for Britain's continuing engagement. It is no longer enough to be in favor of the European Union. Old assumptions can no longer be taken for granted. Highlighting the cost of withdrawal and the uncertainties that Britain would face is no longer enough. Only wholehearted commitment will suffice. Mr. Ming, thank you very much indeed. And I think that the passion in your <laughs> argument was very clear there and uh, appreciated. I am going to, for the next 25 minutes or so, throw this open to questions from the floor and not from me, except for one. I am going to give myself the privilege of the first question, and then I'm going to, I promise you, not ask any more unless hands aren't going up. My one question is this. I was fascinated by the mea culpa phase of your uh, presentation. And you said, you know, we have to accept that we haven't been forcible enough. We haven't been passionate enough. We haven't been out there enough in our making of the case for Europe in front of the British public. Why, if that is the case, do you not embrace the idea of a referendum? Goodness knows, you have to accept there is a crisis right now in the relationship between the European Union and the general view of the British public. Why not embrace the referendum, go out and fight it with everything you've got, and the opinion polls suggest that you would probably win it. That would be the way of finally lancing this boil which has been around in the UK and its relations with Europe for so long. So why not just go for it, do it, be passionate about it and win it? Can you imagine the disruption and concentration which there would be on that at the expense of everything else that government's responsible for? And I can give you a contemporary example. There's going to be a referendum in Scotland on the 18th of September. For the last three years, every decision taken, uh, every political nuance from any one of the four parties in Scotland 
has been seen through the prism of the referendum. And therefore, the quality of governance, which we would be entitled to expect, has been a long short of what it should be. The coalition government, in its agreement, said any material change of uh, powers from Westminster to Brussels uh, would require something, would require a referendum uh, of that kind. And I think that is a stable and reasonable position to adopt. But I'm about to argue against myself for a moment or two, and that is to say, can you conceive of any referendum of any kind whatsoever at the moment which would not turn in, turn in and out referendum? If the question was, for example, the extension of some uh, element of one of the treaties which dealt with social policy or some, something of that kind, do we really think that those who are opposed to British membership would spend all their time in television studios or even down the pub having a pint, which I understand is a rather popular way of political campaigning now, <laughs> considering in magnificent detail every comma and every dot of the proposals on the um, single market. Of course not. They would be arguing in a row. So to that extent, I do argue against myself. But I think the position which I've outlined, and I'm not a slave to the coalition, uh, is for the moment at least a stable one and one that we should be following. But do you not see that there is a, a fundamental legitimacy problem right now with the case for Europe in the United Kingdom? You know, because people like yourself deliver fascinating lectures mm -hmm. explaining how blindingly obvious it is that peace, security, prosperity, all... Uh, rest upon our, our continued membership of the European Union, you would think you would have the confidence to take, and I take your point, it would be messy and it would be years of uncertainty, but if this matters so much, if Britain being in Europe matters so much, live with the uncertainty. We've been through what, four or five years of uncertainty. Yes, yeah, so, it, the, so it, let's just so do let's, it. Let's have another four or five. Well, I mean, that's what will happen if, you, to, if there is to, no referendum. Uh, <coughs> Beginning to sound like hardcore. <laughs> yeah, <isn't> all right. <laughs> True. <laughs> You're absolutely uh, right. No, I, stand, always, I, st I, I plead guilty. You, 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 you can take the man out of hard talk. You can't, <laughs> you can't take hard talk out of the man. I, I, I do plead guilty. No, the, 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 let, me, let me try and make a serious point, if, if I may. Look, in 2010, we were standing on the abyss of a total economic meltdown. And we're not, out of, we're not away from that yet, completely, but we are beginning to put together the components of stability. It seems to me to risk that at this stage, the point I made about businesses and investment, would be dangerous and entirely uh, unsensible in all the circumstances. And if as you're right, and you are right, because rather curiously, um, Two statistics, always dangerous, but the UKIP got fewer, a smaller percentage of the vote these European elections than it did the last time round. And the percentage of people who believe we should stay in the European Union has gone up to 41%. So the rise of UKIP has paradoxically been uh, accompanied by a rise in support for the EU. Why? Because the issues have been brought before people's attention. But... Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to agree to disagree. Well, anyway, mm -hmm. it, it, it may come up again. Who knows? Yes. But we're now going to go to, to your questions, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'll start with you, sir. What I want you to do is uh, brief and concise a question as you can. Just identify yourself and, and give us your question. Um, thank you very much. Um, the name's um, Ewan Grant, uh, former intelligence analyst in the British Customs Service. I've worked for the European Commission. Uh, I have seen corruption in the European Commission. My question is this, and I hope you don't feel it's too unfair. Um, <laughs> is the Deputy Prime Minister's position on relations with Europe in any way affected by um, the desire to protect his children's likely future careers in European Commission-funded <laughs> institutions? <laughs> And well, if, I can, I if can not, can you, can, you, can, can you prove that it isn't? I, I can I'm answer sorry, your I stand by yeah. that comment. Well, let me see if I can give a concise answer to your concise question. No. 
<laughs> and anyone who's ever spent time with Nick Clegg uh, will know that, like all of us, he's human and he has his faults. But the idea that he would seek to exploit his political position in the interests of his children is, in my view, uh, preposterous. Uh, and this is a man, I mean, just, let's, let, let's just put this in context. This is a man whose children were deeply disturbed by demonstrations outside his house and who had to live with the fact that people put excrement through the letterbox. It's a man who would protect his children uh, as much as he possibly could. This is not a man who would indulge or embark upon any political activity or principle which had the purpose of protecting the economic well-being of his children, or indeed of anyone other than the British people as a whole. Right, well, let, let's move on. Um, we'll mix it around. We'll go to different parts of the room, so we'll come down to the front. You, sir? Uh, assuming it's <clears throat> I'm John Preston, um, European Movement in Chatham House. I'm picking on the word reform, which you use quite a lot in your talk, one piece of reform the United Kingdom could do yeah. without referring to Brussels would be to tidy up the electoral system we have for the European Parliament. And the other thing, might we not be consider reform that the commissioners be elected rather than appointed by their governments? Well, it's very interesting because Jack Straw has recently got into this whole question of the way in which the Parliament, to use a neutral expression, comes about. And he's made a point that rather than direct election, what there should be is selection or even perhaps election from existing members of parliament so that those who went to Brussels would know that they had direct and um, unbreakable connection uh, with the British electorate and the British parliament. And therefore, any question about remoteness uh, or an inability to influence events uh, would be, to a large extent, mitigated. Oh, hang now, on, would, would they be doing two jobs at once? Uh, well, but I mean, <laughs> Dr. Paisley did about four jobs at once, so it's not impossible. And is that a model no, we I want mean, to pursue? Look, or? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, it's perfectly reasonable to say that one week, I mean, there's something called the Council of Europe that people spend sometimes. Yeah, but a, frankly, a, that is a, a bit week, of a talking a week shop. A month I mean, there. No. This is, a, this, you know, either the European Parliament is a serious proposition or it isn't. Well, it's a serious proposition, but the question is how can we make sure that it doesn't appear to be remote from the interests of the people of the United Kingdom and every other member state? I'm just offering that as a solution which Jack Straw And, and elected offers. commissioners? I, well, we, yes. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. I mean, you had the situation um, previous occasion, and in fact, she did remarkably well in the circumstances. Cathy Ashton uh, suddenly found herself in circumstances which she was the uh, foreign policy mouth of the European Union, quite unexpectedly. And that came about as a reflection of the choice of the then Prime Minister, Gordon Brown. I think there is something to be said for election in that sense. Well, I, 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 going to you, sir, in just a sec, but just one follow-up on, on the thought. You very plainly said, you know, um, um, good old Mr. Juncker from Luxembourg is not where we should be looking for the next head of the commission. Uh, sorry, for the, well, yeah, next yes, head of the commission. Yes, yes. But, but the fact is, if the European Parliament, which still has as its biggest block the EPP, wishes it to be so, the, the understanding these days is that the European Parliament, as it's elected, as it represents some form of legitimacy in Europe, should have a major say. And now you're suggesting, oh, that's, that's irrelevant. You know, no, no, I not no, the right no, guy. No, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say it was irrelevant. What I said was that I thought that I would not support his election because I think he is a figure from a time in the European Union from which we now have to distance ourselves. I'm not attacking his integrity. No, 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 no. but you are, you are suggesting that the European Parliament's will isn't actually of any great significance at all. No, no, I'm not suggesting that at all. It's got to be taken into account. The words lawyers always use. It's got, <laughs> it, it's got to be taken into account. But you have to ask yourself this. If we're serious about reform, uh, does it make sense to have someone whose previous uh, career is a long way short of suggesting that he's open to the kind of reform which is necessary to create the kind of attachment between the European Union and ourselves that is, in my view, absolutely essential. 
Okay. Uh, sir, you, you, and then we'll come down here to you, ma'am. But, sir, I spotted you earlier with the white shirt. No, um, the gentleman further back, and then, the then ma'am, it'll be you next. But the gentleman with the beard, and then you. I'm, I'm Frank Dominey. I'm uh, a European citizen born in the Irish province. Um, Carl Bildt got there yesterday uh, with the question I want to ask. Uh, how uh, would uh, the uh, peace be maintained in Ireland uh, if the UK were to leave the European Union? Both Jerry and Martin think that leaving is a lousy idea, and the Irish themselves would never under any circumstances quit the European Union. Mm. So how would the UK leave the, um, the European Union without restarting the Irish war? Blimey. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, <coughs> the ghost of Michael Collins <laughs> walks across this discussion. No, I think you make a serious point. And, and here is a serious point. Uh, the border between the North and the South has often existed as a matter of illusion rather than substance. If the United Kingdom was to leave uh, and to have a different policy, as, as an independent country, have a different policy on immigration, then it would be inevitable that there would have to be some greater form of control on the border. Otherwise, the United Kingdom's determination to have its own policy would be of no effect whatsoever. And I'm going to go back to the point which I was making earlier uh, about the fact that cooperation and a consensual approach right, lies right at the very heart of the European Union. And there's no doubt that in achieving the kind of settlement which has been achieved in Northern Ireland, but with the, southern, with the south of Ireland, uh, the fact that both countries were members of the European Union was of enormous significance. They did not have a competing interest that's my point. Common values will always beat competing interests. Ma'am, let's get the microphone to you. Thank you. My name's Paddy Beck. I'm a member of LIBG. Um, this week, I was alarmed to hear the EU say that we must tax um, expensive houses more and that we um, should build far more houses. I, as a Liberal Democrat, I recognize this as our policy, and I'm in uh, full agreement with it. But it seemed to be either mischievous or crass to make that kind of statement at the moment. It was food to the Eurosceptics. Mm -hmm. And I think they were quite uh, right to say, mind your own business, and should this surely be come under subsidiarity? And who mm. started that? Yes. All right. Well, Very clear question. I, I think I've half answered that question already. Principle of subsidiarity should apply in these circumstances. Now, as it happens, we need to build more houses. I'm a constituency member of Parliament. Yeah, but, my, but my, the instruction my, my, coming from Brussels just riles people. Of course it does. Yeah. Yes, I, I don't doubt that for a moment. But the principle of building more houses is... That, I mean, I get enough people in my constituency surgeries to persuade me of the need to build more houses, I can tell you. And indeed, our party has talked about having a mansion tax. Uh, these may be desirable ends, but they're desirable ends to be resolved by the British Parliament. No, I, I shouldn't have called it an instruction because it wasn't an instruction, it was just a piece of advice. But yes. uh, nonetheless, yeah. your point is it's, it's rubbing, Provocative. rubbing people up the wrong way Absolutely. in a way that those who issue the advice perhaps yeah. ought to think more carefully we're, about. We're not short of giving advice ourselves, though, from time <laughs> to time. <laughs> All right, the next one. Um, you say, is that hand up or just half up? Yeah, we're good. All right, then. John Wilson, I'm a member of the, the Institute and, incidentally, a house builder as well. Ah. <laughs> um, my question is this. Uh, I put it to you, Saming, is that for politicians, there can be never a happy ending to an in or out referendum for the UK regarding the EU because the British public want their cake and eat it and this is impossible. <laughs> well, I'm slightly embarrassed by that question for this reason, that I'm part of the Better Together campaign in Scotland, 
which argues that if Scotland stays in the United Kingdom, it can have its cake and eat it. So I feel slightly embarrassed to, to, to an extent. Um, <clears throat> okay, people want everything for the best and the best of all possible worlds. One has to accept that. Uh, I don't think people understand, any more than I think Scots understand, what the implications of withdrawal uh, would be, either from the European Union or the United Kingdom. Uh, and that being so, uh, then I think um, uh, politicians have got a very considerable responsibility to be pointing that out. Now, we're accused in Scotland, better together, of being entirely negative. But I don't think it's negative to explain that if the rest of the United Kingdom doesn't want a currency union, we won't have one. So, uh, is it difficult to satisfy? Uh, but. If you had an in and out referendum and the verdict were to be out, it would take a very, very long time before there could be any question of joining or rejoining. Just as a, as a wise owl of British politics, <laughs> do you think, you know, do you analyse this and think that actually there will be such enormous pressure on Ed Miliband before the general election that Labour probably will have to bow to that pressure mm. and sign up to the idea of an in out referendum as well? Because if that becomes the case, then Whatever happens, almost certainly Britain will be having an in-out referendum despite all of your misgivings. Well, there is a very, very um, uh, febrile debate taking place within the Labour Party about that very issue. And I think what you, do you think? I think you, I think you interviewed Jack Straw I did. yesterday, and uh, I'd be very interested. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, well, watch it. I, I, I highly actually, recommend yeah. you all do, because we, <laughs> we, uh, we spend a lot of time um, talking about this, and it's I'll, actually fascinating. I'll do my best to keep the audience <laughs> numbers up. Uh, um, <coughs> but just to go on, you get, uh, well, if, if you had to, if you had to, if, just if I had to guess, bet, but yeah, bet. If between, I had to bet, mm. I think it's an even. I think it's a, I no, think it's an what even a cop out. Bet. What a cop out. No, no, I, I don't look. We know that within the Labour Party and in the shadow cabinet, there are two competing views on this, uh, and Jack Straw has the difficult problem of holding all of that, all of that together. I think a lot depends, frankly, on the extent to which the Conservative Party. Um, it comes under internal pressure as a result of the very substantial number of sceptics that there are on the back benches of, of, of the Conservative Party. And one straw in the wind is that on occasion in the last four years when issues have arisen uh, about Europe, the Labour Party has been quite happy to abandon what might be regarded as its principles on this subject and to vote in a way which embarrassed the government. So I think the answer to your question is, I don't think it will be a question of a, a matter of principle. It will be a question of tactics. All right, we're going to do the ver speed dating version of questions because okay. we don't have that much time. So I'm going to take two at once, and Ming's going to have to answer them very quicker. concisely. Yeah. We'll start right at the back with you, sir, in the corner, just because we haven't been over in that corner. Sorry, microphone people, but I'll get you running. Here we go. Hi, uh, Leo from Bulo Quirk, um, managing partner, Chartwell Partners. Um, you claim that the arguments. Speak as close as you can. Sorry, to the mic. is yeah. that better? You claim that the arguments for um, um, Britain staying in the EU are overwhelming and clear, and you spoke eloquently to that fact. But if these arguments are so clear um, and overwhelming, but your leader still gets significantly beaten by Nigel Farage in a public debate, surely the logical conclusion is that you need a new leader. Would you agree? <laughs> well. Uh, that's a run. No, don't answer it because we're going to do two at once. Uh, we'll go to you, sir, with your hand up. Yep. Could we just look for a moment at uh, my name is Dennis Loretto, Liberal Democrat and uh, European, European Movement. Uh, could we just look for a moment at the problems created by the existence of the Eurozone and then the other countries within the European Union, such as ourselves, outside it? It doesn't tend, to my mind, to get examined closely enough. We tend to poo-poo the idea of a two-tier Europe, but in effect, in some sense of that term, that's what it must be because there will inevitably be greater moves towards greater integration and ever closer union, if you like, at least within the Eurozone, if it's really going to work, whereas we will be outside that. I happen to think that we have a fantastic situation in the United Kingdom by managing to be in the European Union, have all its benefits, and, and be able to run our own currency as well. And, uh, I think that's very good if we continue to do that. But 
we need to look at what the implications of that right. are for Europe. Yeah. Okay, so first one's a quickie. No. Clegg got, Clegg, <laughs> well, what, what, would happen, what would have to happen to Nick Clegg before the answer might be yes? Nick Clegg, in my view, is the person best qualified to lead our party between now and during the next general election and on into the next parliament. Of that, there is absolutely no doubt. And I think even perhaps this week, Rod Oakshot might have come round to agreeing with me. <laughs> well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, all right. Casting a fly. In, interesting question here. Yes. Answer it as briefly as you can. Two-tier Europe becoming more and more of a reality. The truth is we know that for the Eurozone to, to um, work in the future, there is going to be more integration. It's not clear quite how far that will go, but it, it's happening. So what are the long-term implications uh, of well, a two-tier Europe, particularly for Britain, being in, yeah. quote-unquote, the second tier? Well, constitutional arrangements needn't be symmetrical. A very good illustration of that, of course, is Spain, where there are different degrees of devolution to different regions. And you can, in my view, have an effective union in which uh, you could have a difference in relation to currency. We've had a pretty effective union. Maybe no problem with the currency, but the problem, in my view, with the currency is we allowed people to join who clearly were not capable of, of sustaining the conditions, who then thought that they could go on with the same levels of public spending that they always had, and therefore, and that the requirement not to have a deficit of uh, uh, beyond a certain percentage of GDP was something which could be disregarded. It wasn't the currency that was wrong, the idea of the currency that was wrong the way in which individual countries administer it. And if you want an illustration of the opposite side of it, Germany, uh, part of the European Union, part of the, part of the single currency, did not <coughs> suffer in the same way as Spain or Italy. Is it official, yes or no, is it official policy of the Lib Dems still to believe that UK best interest is in joining the Eurozone? In the long term, yes, but subject to two conditions, which we always said at the time. First, that that would be a major change, constitutional change, and would, would require a referendum. And second, joining would depend upon the rate at which uh, the currency, rate, rate of currency exchange at which we would join. Neither of these conditions uh, have been fulfilled. <laughs> All right. Uh, right, we're going to do two more, and then we're going to assess the time situation. Um, the gentleman behind you, actually, sir, because he's been very patient, and, and he's given me such a forlorn look, because I haven't turned to him right. yet. Go on, uh, you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Nick Hopkinson, LIBG, Eldeg, and Chatham House, plus others, but I won't go on. Um, yes, um, how many referenda does it take to uh, lance uh, the European boil? And uh, why don't we have referenda on uh, the NHS, uh, jobs, education, and, and so on, which are the matters uh, that really matter to people on, on, on the doorstep? And whatever happened to the uh, fact that we're a parliamentary democracy? Um, well, aren't the... Uh, oh, then never mind. Answer it now. We're right, supposed to have another one. Well, but isn't there an internal inconsistency in that argument? Because if we are a parliamentary democracy, then no referendums at all. But I, think, was, I think that, that question was entirely sarcastic, I oh, think. Right. Am I right? Though it was heavy use of sarcasm. Well, for, yeah. Yeah, forgive my naivety. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure um, we allow questions with but such if there's extreme a major, sarcasm. major constitutional change, and a single currency would be a major constitutional change, then I think you have to seek authority for doing that. I think if you don't, then you uh, lay up a whole raft of difficulties coming down the track afterwards. Yeah, I mean, the sarcasm was, was aimed at a guy who basically agrees with everything you were implying. So I'm not sure we were going to get too far with that, but thank you very much. Uh, so you, you, we haven't been over this side very much, so um, off you go. Robin Munro Davis, member of Chatham House. I'm really taken by your mayor culpa, but I don't see how you're going to get this reform. You sit there saying, we made a mistake and we've got to get reform. How are you going to achieve it? I find the, uh, the, the European Parliament I'm deeply undemocratic. So as a pro-European, I just don't see where you are going to get the change. Well, not so much Mayor Cooper, but Nostra Cooper. We're all in this together. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, like, we, like the, <laughs> we like the mayor bit as you're here. <laughs> and, uh, I thought I might swap places with you. <laughs> um, look, you can, there's, there's a form that you can achieve within the existing treaty frameworks. I've given an indication, the whole issue of proportionality and subsidiarity. That's something you can do. There are a whole variety of things. You can 
help to make more effective the single market. And if you once embark upon a program of reform which is successful, then you are more capable of persuading people to go further. But you can only do it with but partners. You're yes, almost exactly. implying you can, only, you can do it by yourself. No, no, you no, you can, only do it with, you can only do it. That's why I talked about but, allies. But, uh, but by that, and large, a lot of these things you're airily saying we can achieve, but, not but, many other people want to achieve. Well, Mrs. Merkel wants to make the single market operate more efficiently. Why? Because it's comprehensively in the interests of Germany that, that, that we should do so. Uh, in uh, Holland, uh, they have got uh, rather similar views on transitional arrangements for migration. You can make alliances within the European Union if you go and look for them. If, on the other hand, you say, do it our way or else we're going to walk away, then that is not going to be persuasive. All right, we'll do two more, and then I'm, unfortunately, my rubbish timekeeping, we're going to be out of time. So you've been very patient, and, and you've got my eye, so you go first. Wait for the mic, though. Here you go. Uh, Neville Waits from Reading University and a member of Chatham House. Uh, I think on the positive side, uh, much of what you said I agreed with, but I felt certain things were too abstract. For women... The European Union has done wonders yes. in yeah. terms of pension rights yeah, for part-time uh, part workers, and inevitably a lot of women uh, have to uh, be in a position of dealing with a family as well as years of work. And it's only the part-time regulations yeah. which uh, were resisted, really, by the, the British yeah. authorities, but pushed through uh, from the European Union that achieved that Is there years. a question, sir? Okay, question. Uh, you've you've uh, said only that uh, benefit rights can be controlled for immig immigrants. I don't think that that point is going to cut much ice with the uh, skeptics. I think that uh, is there any, the question is, is there any way that the European Union could agree to um, some forms of control over immigration. And between change the freedom states. of movement principle in a way that actually is no longer complete yeah. freedom of movement. Well, yes? Anyway, let's stick with well, that. It's not just freedom, it's freedom of capital as well. Yeah, but... And if you start uh, interfering with that, then that does take away from a very substantial part uh, of, these, of the single market. Freedom of movement... Uh, allows countries, for example, that require scientists uh, to recruit scientists from other parts of the European Union. Uh, if you start saying, well, you can't recruit scientists or you can't recruit doctors or, or whatever, then you effectively bring an end to the single market. You can control it, but in my view, you can't abolish but the, it. I mean, that's what uh, the Tories appear to be taking to Brussels as, as one of the planks of their fundamental reform project. Well, you see, do all these things. If you're not going to require a new treaty or amend existing treaties, then all of these things are capable of being done if you form alliances to do so. All right. Uh, it'll have to be the last one, I'm afraid. Sir, you've also <coughs> had your hand up several times, so you get the prize of the last question. Good, thank you. So it better be a darn good one. Well, <laughs> I hope it is. Uh, Derek Honeygold, uh, member of Chatham House, of course, and uh, of course I joined the Liberal Party in 1956 at a time when it was the unequivocally the only European party. We're not going to go through every Europe. year from 56 now, to now, are we? The, 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 the question I want to ask is the relationship with the liberal international rule-based order. In those days, of course, in 56, we were thinking very much about those because it, it was a, something would, that had been achieved in the, in the previous decade. In the years I taught at university, I always concentrated in the introductory lecture on the link between Europe and the rule-based order. And it seems to me that I, I obviously welcome the fact that we fought this election, not like the previous two, but on, this time we fought it as the party of Eden. But I wonder whether that was sufficient, or whether we should have dealt with the end rather than the means to the end as our, as our aim. Because we're seeing the, the, the rule-based order decay. And it seems to me that there is a role for the, that Europe has not been playing its part in that order. So, right. I think that, that, that I think I've covered what is important about this. 
Well, uh, I'm just not so quite sure what the question, sure the question is. The question, the, the, <laughs> all right, well, the question is... Keep it simple. Go on, the, simple the as you can. The question is, should, should, we be, should we be concentrating on the end rather than the means? Europe's part in the, in the rule-based order mm -hmm. rather than just the end, which seems to me... Well, the the, the, the mm -hmm. means to the end, which is the single market. Because I mean, there are no other pillars. Well, I rather thought I, I was making that point when I was... Uh, giving my remarks, which is that the end, in fact, I, yeah. I, I, I described it. That nations which join together, cooperation, the common purpose, uh, committed to um, democracy, freedom, uh, the rule of law. I mean, that's the end. Uh, and that's why I went out of my way to try and emphasize that. I, 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 as an objective observer, think you sort of did. So, yes. yeah, I would say you did cover that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I do always think it's a very good sign when you've come to the end of, of time and there are still arms going up and people clearly very engaged and wanting to take part and wanting to ask questions of our guests. That's, it's a great sign that it, actually it's, it's generated... Um, you know, a real interest and a, a lot of constructive debate. Unfortunately, we are out of time, um, so I think I have to be disciplined with myself. I have some very good news to announce, which is that everybody is invited upstairs to a reception, which I do believe might include uh, alcohol. Does it include? Yeah, 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 good. Excellent. So everybody can relax with a glass of wine. But before we do that, I just want to thank one more time Sue and everybody who has put this event together at Chatham House, because I've thoroughly enjoyed being involved. It's been a great pleasure for me to get the chance to listen to Ming and to meet you and to hear the questions. But most of all, ladies and gentlemen, please give a very, very big thank you and a warm hand to Sir Ming Campbell. <laughs> Ming, thank, thank you very much.